I watched this and I was like, why couldn't he have just done Ant-Man? Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Real Chumps. We're chatting about movies, feels like hanging out with friends. I'm your host, Marcel, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Danny. This week, we're going to continue our month-long watch of thriller, spooky, and some scary movies. We are watching the 2004 film, Shaun of the Dead, directed by Edgar Wright and written by Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright, starring Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, Kate Ashfield, Lucy Davis, and many more. But before we jump into our movie, we just want to remind you, everyone that's listening, watching, to please subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Turn on your notifications, that way you never miss an episode, and that way you can follow along. If you want to join the conversation, follow us on social at Real Chums, and if at the end of the episode you enjoyed it, be sure to share it with a friend and leave a review so we know how we're doing. It really helps us get discovered and so we can make improvements on the show. Okay, here's a couple thoughts to, to kind of begin. One, I just realized this is so far for our Halloween spooky marathon that we're doing. We've done Signs, Get Out, and we're doing Shaun of the Dead. I just realized all of them are directed and written by an individual. By an individual. I mean, right here, Simon Pegg did most of the writing here, but right. Edgar Wright also was involved in the in still. The but I just pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. I'm just saying, we have a little uh. I don't know, a little something going on here. Nice little, <laughs> a little nugget of goodness, movie yeah. goodness. Um, we are excited. So we're, you have the question of the day. So if you are new here, um, I just want to introduce you to our little fun segment of question of the day, where we ask a question that kind of connects to the podcast, whether it be funny or serious. Today, what do you got for me? All right, Danny. Let's say you are at a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, it caught you by off guard. There's a zombie in your backyard. Yeah. And you have a box of records. <laughs> okay. And you have three records. Only three? I have a box of records okay. and there's only... It's right, okay. you, I, I got you. I got yeah, you. Right. But of order of which one you're throwing first, between Pink Floyd's The Dark Side of the Moon, <laughs> Michael Jackson's Thriller, <laughs> and I know you're a Beatles fan, and Abbey Road by The Beatles. Oh. Which one are you throwing first <laughs> okay so uh pink floyd um you're the Beatles. Pink floyd? no no sorry oh, okay, I'm just, I'm, okay. so pink floyd uh, thriller and abbey road right the dark side of the <clears> moon <throat> uh-huh by pink floyd yep um well it's a zombie apocalypse so let's um i'll probably do thriller first i don't know to thrill the zombies to death okay <laughs> Two? Would, you, would you say that's your least favorite of those three albums? No, I have. I'm not gonna classify this by favorites. <laughs> I'm gonna classify this by the least, the one I like. The, I don't know. That's a hard call. I don't have favorites very often. Okay, all right. Um, I think in the moment, I just would probably it would feel right to do Abbey Road second, and then Dark Side of the Moon last because it's a dark day. Oh, on planet Earth with a zombie <laughs> in my backyard. <laughs> All right. Okay. What's your what's your breakdown? I would throw a thriller first in the hopes that I don't have to throw <laughs> uh, Abbey Road or No, hold on. I would throw a thriller first. Hopefully I knock out that zombie. If I didn't, then I would throw uh Dark Side of the Moon by yeah. Pink Floyd. Yeah. And lastly, I would rather die than throw Abbey Road. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Uh, that movie, that that scene in the movie is so great. It is I love great. it so much. We'll talk about it here in a second. All right. I actually also had a question. Um, yeah. What would be the most mundane job you could have that would make you, make you not realize that there is a zombie apocalypse approaching? Um, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> A window cleaner. A window cleaner? Yeah. Wow, like that's a, a pretty, pretty good one, dude. Because you're just up there on I'm that just little. Up there. You're on that little thing, <laughs> just. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Move on to the next panel of windows. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Very good. I you? feel like I would a uh, nighttime security guard. Well, <laughs> like one, you're. 
if especially like you're in like a small town or something uh-huh. and like but you have to do security you sleep all day mm-hmm. you go at night into you know not a lot of people are out mm-hmm. just chilling okay. dude i i mean i hope you are more aware of what's happening as a security guard well but, you, you know yeah. you would think you, you would think, think. bro <laughs> But uh, I've worked grave shifts before, okay? I know how brutal they are. <laughs> I don't care how vigilant you are. That 3 o'clock a.m. comes around, and you're like, you're, oof. You're, you turn into a zombie yourself. <laughs> uh, let us know in the comments below. Uh, what job would be so... How did you word it? <laughs> What's the most mundane job that, you, could, that you, would, you think you would have that would make you feel like you would completely miss the zombie apocalypse? And let us know out of those three albums... Dark Side of the Moon, Thriller, and Abbey Road. Which one? What's your order of throwing them? Yeah, I'd rather live. But <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> die into a freaking zombie. That sounds like a terrible way to die. Uh, as we f- well see in this movie. Yeah. Um, dude, this movie is fantastic. I had not seen this in... Oh, yeah. Like ages. A while. Yeah, it's been at least like 12, probably longer years yeah, for me. I'd probably say the same because I think I watched it several times in high school. Uh-huh. I don't remember the exact first time I watched it. Um, it, I think it had to be with a group of friends, maybe after something. I'm sorry, guys, if you can hear my stomach grumbling. Um, <laughs> apparently, I did not eat enough breakfast, so uh, the, the monster that you're hearing from me is my stomach. <laughs> it's not a zombie in, in the background. <laughs> um, yeah, I just I remember loving it. It was a huge thing, even in high school, doing some media stuff. It was a huge. Um, People wanted to recreate the, the whole like, the quick cut smash zoom, yeah. um, sort of sequence stuff. Um, even today, like I think a lot, that's a huge. People watch this movie. They see Edgar Wright. They see this sort of style. They like loved. They want. They it's a, it's actually a really great exercise to replicate as a first time filmmaker mm-hmm. <clears throat> because they're really. Um, it teaches the principle of in and, in and out, which is um, starting your clip with you coming into the frame um, and usually like leaving the frame. Uh, But in this case, it's just entering the frame and then cutting to each of the next segments. Um, So like a lot of times if I'm teaching individuals how to do filmmaking, I tell them, okay, I teach them the principle, which is, you know, bringing something into the shot and then out of the shot. And what you can do is basically um, as long as you're bringing something into the shot, you can record a whole sequence like building your sandwich. But then what you can do is you can cut out uh, clips to make the sequence shorter or longer as needed okay um and it's a really great uh exercise for understanding like how to like oh well how to condense something even as long as you have something that's clean right something coming in leaving the frame Hmm. um it's pretty great let's let's jump in okay real quick so this movie it follows sean who is a electronic salesman uh dating his girlfriend lucy liz liz of three years of three years Hi, Sean. It's Liz. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye, bye, bye. <laughs> bye, bye, bye. Um, and who finds himself living a very mundane, uh, repetitive life when all of a sudden he gets broken up by Liz and a zombie apocalypse breaks out and he has to deal with that, trying to win back his girlfriend and his mom and stepdad. Yep. Okay. Great. Let's talk about let's talk about Edgar Wright's style of like. Is this his first? This is not. A, is this his first movie? He had done like a very low budget. I'm pretty sure this is his his first like like major major film. Yes, it is. He uh, yes, it is. He had done so, and Simon Pegg had run had written in another like skit show called Space. I think. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think Edgar, Edgar Wright had like directed a couple episodes of that. Um, but yes, this is Edgar Wright's first like big directorial debut. Mm-hmm. What is it about that stylized type of of like quick shots, quick edits that fits so well in this movie? Okay, so I've been dying to talk about this because I've been watching The Bear. Okay, and The Bear also takes this idea to the next level. Hmm. And I what I what I love about it um, is what I think about how the the two use it differently, but what I fell in in watching rewatching this scene is the fact that it's the sense of a quick 
slow and quick experiences and that in um that throughout his life and throughout this movie we have these slow moments followed by a sequence of short quick punchy things mm-hmm. and in the beginning a lot of it kind of to help emphasize the mundanity mm-hmm. um of life of his life okay yeah. if you think about okay so the perfect example that i talk about the him the slow waking up we know from the the tr- from the big from trailer slash poster that this is a zombie movie okay yeah. And the like, literally for I mean, how long is it? Like twenty five minutes, maybe even thirty minutes before we really see an, a zombie, a real I- yeah, interaction yeah. with a zombie, right? The backyard scene, yeah. So, um, but you get this slow. Oh, you see the, the feet walking up. <clears throat> you get these zombie sounds, and it, then you see Sam, Simon Pegg yawning, waking up, and then it goes quick cuts. Uh, the utensil drawer, bread, mm-hmm. and then. Smet, and then he's like, uh, and he walks outside the, the, the head, he's out, he he's walks outside, outside right? Yeah, yeah. And one of the first things that happens is he gets hit in the head by a ball, right? So this idea of quick to slow, mm-hmm. I think helps to emphasize the mundane slowness of mm. his life, right? Whereas in the bear, you have very similar situations, quick montage cuts, um, to slow sequences that are long or whatever, um, that, or even slow intercut segments of different characters that are happening that help that bring greater emotion and to those characters in a fast pace, like things that are happening quickly in a, like a kitchen okay. in a, a restaurant right. scenario that happens. And it intensifies those feelings because you have these quick li- sequences um, that then that is jarring which again is one of those things that in in editing a lot of it comes down to juxtaposition right you fast to slow mm-hmm. um horror to beautiful um you know uh, suspenseful to like peaceful right these things that help control throw your your yourself into loop or maybe even like sound of sound design knowing that something is tenseful right to then having complete relief or something right mm-hmm. and being let go <clears throat> all those things help benefit and that's where i think this the, this these cuts and sequences come into play i love that you explain that how how it gives a, a good feeling of like the mundane of of his life right and it gets a, it gives us a great juxtaposition of of the quick to just how boring his life is essentially look, look i think the the opposite the opposite end of this is walt the secret life of walter mitty oh okay okay yeah, yeah yeah so walter mitty the secret life of walter mitty although is a completely beautiful movie and mm-hmm. i'm excited to do that with you one day yeah. because it's, i think it's just a wonderful movie um that movie brings us to a mundane world through a little like, there's there's still a sense of like the fast cut stuff but a lot of it is really slow and the opening sequences and stuff like that. And so you have two ways of doing this. I mean, this is his first direct directorial debut. He comes from a TV show experience where tight, you're right. There's not a lot of like locations to this. It's pretty yeah. there. And so, but you also like if they had done slow things throughout the whole thing and him being whatever, it would have been too, it would have been too slow, yep. too boring. And, people would have lost interest and they would have said it's not a good movie. But I think because of the way that you, they leveraged editing in the story, like they do in the bear, um, as part, and I don't know, like this is something I didn't do research because I didn't have enough time, but if how much of the editing process or even like some of that planning in the pre-production came into play when they came into for their actual production, right? Which I imagine to a degree probably Mm -hmm. it did. Yeah. Um, but again, I like if you rewatch as you watch this, movie again you'll you can um i think again because i've watched i was watching the bear with this i really and i've been consuming a lot of content surrounding the editing and kind of the story aspect with the bear i'm really aggressively seeing the connections here um with uh shot of the dead and the yeah. cutting and the style of these the, the sequences mm-hmm. like i mean the perfect example is is the scene where they talk about what's the plan the plan that's what i was going to bring up I, I love that because, uh, and, and you bring up a good point, like 
had had they just shown a had Edgar Wright just shown the mundaneness of his life, waking up, flushing the toilet, like it would be a bit it, it almost heavy handed of like yes. this is this is a boring man with a boring lifestyle, with a boring career, with everything, right? But by giving us those quick shots and and showing us uh inviting us to like experience like yeah this is boring but boom 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 the doorbell ringing the grabbing the shovels whatever it is right it also creates for me as a viewer a sense of of like urgency in this mundaneness not only that but like i think in a lot of the sequences there's i love so we we get to introduce uh to sean particularly in the pub in the winchester Mm -hmm. And after a she <laughs> first. and and I love this first scene because not only it not only does it have you see a sense of mundaneness, but he's getting talked at from his girlfriend, yeah. Who's then he's got his buddy who's playing the arcade game, and then he's got the two the the two friends that are like uh-huh. the hanging out, yeah, talking at him, and he's just chilling there, like trying to stay focused, <laughs> and. I what I love is that we get a sequence. We it ends with him there, or we 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 get introduced. We have this verbal play with a little bit of cutting, um, but then we we also then we get introduced to his like sh- crazy struggle of life. Yeah, and we see a little bit of additional effort where like he's not like mad with his situation. He's complacent, but he's compl. There you go. Yeah, yeah, he's complacent, right? And he he often. Let's let's dig into like the character of of Sean. Excuse me. Um, he's complacent because even even when he's at the electronics store, he talks about like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do some big stuff in my life. Like I'm, I've got big plans. Yeah. And then the the one employee's like, when? Yeah. <laughs> you know, right? Like when are you gonna do all this? Uh, but yeah, he he's stuck. He's complacent. Um, he has a he has he he loves his friend uh, Ed. What is it about these two characters that makes us root for them or, or just like them, I guess? Um, I think... Oh, okay, that's a good question. Like, what, what, what makes Sean and Ed such relatable and endearing? That's what I'm looking at. Endearing characters despite their many flaws. <laughs> yeah. okay, especially Ed, that introduction. <laughs> he's like, he doesn't have many friends. And then he's like, you... Yeah, C words. Yeah. <laughs> Can I get you a, any any drinks? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Like, there's a reason why Ed doesn't have many yes. friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're 100 right. Like, I love again. They he, they did a phenomenal job introducing. I think part of it. Oh, and then reemphasizing the like, why is Ed here? Right. <laughs> why is he just he? They you know like you know he's great. Yeah, that was three years ago <laughs> with the like the late night in the monkey or the ring and chain. Uh, or whatever the, the situation is. I think what it comes down to is that there's something, there's a level of f- when you have a friend that makes you feel, or you have an individual in your life that helps you feel excited or that makes you feel um, connected and that you're not only, but like that you share a sense of connection or um, that there's, you always enjoy, you always have a great time mm-hmm. or that you have an enjoyable time with them. There's something to be said about that and I think that part of that comes down to the fact that they're adults. As adults, the idea of working in this dead job mm-hmm. and you have no one in your life, you know, people looking at you and telling you all the time that you're not, what are you doing with your life or what's going on? Having somebody there, even though they're not, <laughs> there's many flaws, <laughs> find connection to that's there. There's, if you can look it up, there's a huge amount of articles that talk about that. Right yeah. now, we're in a lone, uh, uh, a a uh, so what is it? What do they call it? A uh, friend epidemic, mm. where many adults suffer from feeling like they're alone. They're alone. They don't yeah. really have any real connections, and that they they don't have any. They don't find that there's there's no connect. Yeah, there's no connection. Right at the end of the day, there's no connection for themselves with a greater friend or even a community mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and part of that comes down to the world that we live in yeah and i think that that's in in this t- 
time period, the corporate life was that. Hmm. I think now people aren't okay with corporate and like with like job and trying to find join your job um, or doing things that, that provide you excitement. But then people get caught up in that, that journey and are stuck reminiscing on social of, of comparison and thinking, I wish I had it better. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love that. I think there's a genuine, obviously chemistry between, between Sean and Ed. And, and a lot of it is, uh, um, Simon Pegg talked a lot of how he based this a lot on his, on his own life, right? Cause they were roommates growing up or <laughs> in their twenties. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the jokes are even like he pulls them from, from their real life, like the whole monkey thing. Yeah. He would do that. <laughs> it, it was a party favor that he would do at parties. Um, anyways, uh, but, but you see that. And, and I think a lot of this goes, Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright, especially Simon Pegg as a, as a writer, he brings such genuine sincerity to his characters, very flawed characters, but there is that sensibility and that genuine, genuineness that makes us like the character. I think you see this a lot in, in the Mission Impossible's. Yeah, yeah. He, in, in, in even, I, I still think, you haven't seen the third Star Trek, uh, the latest, or you have. No, I have seen have, it. I've just seen it once, right? I think that one's my favorite one, right? And that one's r- strictly written by Simon Pegg. Um, I don't think I realized that. Yeah, yeah, that, that one, he wrote it himself. But that's what I like about Sean and, and Ed. Ed, a dick, jerk, but there's a genuine sincerity to him about his appreciation to to how Sean defends him, uh, supports him, even in his quirkiness. <laughs> but that's I think that is so crucial in establishing that, especially in a comedy movie, um, this comedy horror movie, that we take that time to introduce the characters. How often do we do we see or watch zombie movies where we're briefly introduced to them and then blackout happens and then they wake up and boom, they're zombies. Yeah. Right. Whereas this one, it's a slow, gradual introduction to them and gradual introduction to the zombies. Like you mentioned, it's not until like the 25th, 30th minute where we see the actual zombies. And I think that allows us as a viewers to get behind these characters because on paper, Ed is a dick. Like, no, no he's a Ed, jerk. Ed, but we like him. Ed is a dick. Sean is a bum. Is a bum. Uh, Liz is. Liz is one hundred percent justified in expressing how she feels about Sean. Yes, and right? and not only that, but then you have what's the what's the the other dude? David. David. Freaking, Freaking David. David. <laughs> <laughs> um, you got David and his his girlfriend who. Oh man, what's her name? Do you remember? Uh, Anyways, her, the girlfriend. Yeah. The uh, and ha- having that s- situation. Okay. Uh, because Di- of, Diane. Y- yeah. Diane. So yeah. the whole situation with the, I love that you bring up the fact that they uh, with the characters. Why do you feel when you when you would describe this movie? What type of? I mean, obviously it's a it's a comedy horror, but like, what is the overall like messaging? that you find here in, um, in, like if, if there was like a small little nugget because like there's not there's i mean it's a freaking horror zo- comedy film yeah so so you know and it's and it's funny it's great there's not a lot but there is i find i was reminded mm-hmm. and i think you bringing up the, the discussion talking about sean and ed um of the thing that i was reminded about this film i feel like at the end at its core, this movie is about, yeah, friendship, but like adulthood and complacency. Yeah. And we see that. Um, I, I love that the movie, there's a scene where he's going to work, okay? And and he is just like on a bus, or no, I think he might be coming back from work. He's in the bus, and, and, and the camera just shows him sitting in a, in a crowded bus, and people are just kind of, Soned out. Yeah, you don't know if there's a zombie there. Yeah, or if they're just all complacent, just going through the motions in yeah. life, like zombies do, right? Yeah. And and then like he looks out the window, and then like we see someone like falling to the ground or, or yeah, whatever, yeah. right? But like, 
at, at its core, that's what this movie is about. It's 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 a it's a really good character study of adulthood and complacency. Yeah. With the backdrop of using zombies to personify these ch- these these themes. I would also even say like on the flip side like the fact that being a the not being the the not necessarily the bump but like the oddball mm-hmm. that is perhaps some in, in this movie a moocher but I would say going against the grain um Ed feels the most alive mm. Liz also feels alive too yeah yeah but who I think even provides the best character in juxtaposition is the like is it the is it a former girlfriend yeah it seems like yeah right she's like a former girlfriend um what I, is her name i wrote my i wrote my thing um in my, so my notes is um i love the the connection between this other girl that we find yvonne yvonne yeah who comes in he's like oh and there's something there that they seem similar but that like um or in complacency, but they're like they're the ones that are taking, moving things along, mm-hmm. because there's an external pressure in that like, you know, like there's a force, right? Yeah. But I love the scene where they have the two sequences, <laughs> and it's like an alternate reality <laughs> for the whole situation. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to ask you, what it what is it about it? What do you find when you watch this movie and you think we're watching it now? Yeah. Uh-huh. What is it about that's? Do you feel like they added this se- this scene into this? Film? And you're talking about like the doppelgangers when they're all like yes. walking by yes. next to each other. Because uh, that's a whole other story. Like literally, they could have made a whole other movie on the other flip side as like a, you know, I don't uh, Yvonne, right? Is Yvonne, yeah, yeah. Yvonne of the, of the dead. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know. I'm just saying, like, there, that's, there's a whole other story there that like mirrors whatever's happening over there and we mm-hmm. get a small sense of that but i wanted to know what why you feel like this was really strong i i think what stood out is that yvonne right the doppelganger of sean sean's whole plan is we're gonna get everyone and we're gonna go to the the winchester okay to the same place the same beer the same uh safety safetyness of it all Whereas Yvonne, and we see her earlier in, in the movie where she's like, oh, are you still dating Liz? Yeah, we just hit you know, our, our three-year anniversary last week. Oh, what'd you do? Oh, we're going to barely celebrate it, right? Again, Sean, the complacency where the three-year anniversary wasn't a big deal for him. What are we going to do? Oh, we're going to go celebrate it. We're probably at the Winchester, right? She represents the Sean that, that is proactive. She's not going to stay in town. She's going to leave where Sean is going to stay. She is someone who looks back at him, the ex-girlfriend who maybe realized that Sean was just too complacent and that's fine. That's what who you want to be. I'm moving on. And in this in that scene, literally physically, it's showing us that she is she she's somewhere else above, not above, but like just a completely different person who has moved on and is literally moving on by showing us that she's going the complete opposite way that he's coming from despite possibly having a very similar situation in her life yeah because we see the the same boy like the boyfriend there and the david look alike and <laughs> what a funny scene. <laughs> it's, such a fun, it's so great but i love i loved your because i was trying to like process it and i and i appreciated it i appreciate you like giving me your thoughts because I think you're right. I think it really is the epitome. Because, like, in my, in my in the notes, I was like, you know, like, was this like the girlfriend in the life that with an individual that he that could have made him been be the the best self? Mm-hmm. Because they connect on 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 a on a personal individual level, yeah. and that individual has a proactiveness that he would then like go for with, right? right? I'm not saying Liz doesn't do that, but. There's there's this idea of like saying wanting to do things and she does it, but then waiting for somebody f- to want to do it with you. Yeah, and go ahead. No, no, and and I do think Liz does bring out the it, it, eventually she brings out the best in Sean, right? 
But Yvonne was never meant to be that girlfriend. She was the, the girlfriend that was like, I can't wait for you. I can't, quote unquote, fix you, right? I, I need to move on with my life. Yeah. And her seeing that scene of her moving on, passing them, she could have easily said, oh, why don't you follow us? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When he says, what are you guys doing? Uh, Going to the Winchester. Going to the Winchester. Oh, oh. good luck. Good luck. <laughs> right? And so, like, she understands that he is just, at this moment, still stuck in his complacency, in his safety zone. Right? Uh, where she's like, nah, this isn't, we're not safe here. I'm moving on. I think you're bringing up a good point that like Liz does bring out the best in Sean, but it requires, it required a existential like apocalypse yeah. for it to be a thing that, that takes place, right? And, but how often do we require these extreme events in our lives to wake us? Thank you. I have, I, I, I learned a saying early in when I was on a mission, uh, that's like there is no comfort in a growing zone and there's no growing in a comfort zone. Mm. And I'm feeling that again right now. <laughs> yeah. I, like I'm reminded again and again how much. So I, you know, starting your own business or, you know, breaking out to be a freelancer or whatever is, is a, is a big um, thing to do. I did not jump into freelancing um, right when I got done with college or even like I, I freelance, but I didn't do full-time freelance. Right. Yeah. And, a lot of that is because I wanted to start a family. Mm-hmm. And even though there are individuals out there who are amazing and they were able to do, they did that, to some degree they may have had a relationship, whether that be they got married or they were dating for a long time period and had th- they were able to like, their responsibilities were manageable so they could build that, that thing. I decided to have a family. We decided not only get married, but have a family, have mm-hmm. kids r- right away. Yeah. That was a choice that my wife and I made, which is a choice that every you know couple should you know that's yeah. The, 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 but for us that was the and that was a big thing for me and I felt like I had the responsibility to bring in health insurance and make sure that that was covered. And at the time, I mean, really, even now it's still it's better, but it's still difficult to like find those things as a freelancer, right? Um, and sometimes I look back and I'm like, oh, this is, I should have maybe started sooner, hmm. right? But I have to remind myself that like. I grew a lot in those struggling moments of like not loving my job. Yeah. I learned lots of different skills. I learned a lot about, about self individual mm-hmm. motivation and understanding. And I had, and even now I have to remember, remind myself that like, no, it's okay that I am, per, I'm, it's taking longer to find that next client or, um, th- or I have to be reminded, okay, maybe I'm not looking in the right spot. I need to be focusing on making progress in there. When sometimes we get complacent and we, we, in some cases it might be like Liz's portion where she's complacent. She doesn't want to be complacent, but she doesn't know how to move forward. Mm. And she, you know, like there's a little, you need that looking for validation or whatever, trying to find in your partner or whatever. And at the end of the day, you have to be like in Yvonne and say, oh, no, I've, I'm going to make these goals or I'm going to make progress on, on in my life yeah. through the means that I have a bit of, of that I have control over. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, like I, I love that this is then reinforced this idea at the end of the movie with how the zombies are now just part of life. They're just part of life. They, they reintegrate them into <laughs> like the mundane jobs of society. They, and, and like the idea of couples and the, 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 I love my husband. I know that he like, but I just love him. And I, I want to like, this reinforces that like but really at the end of the day, if we want something to change mm-hmm. that we have all we have the ability individually to make to make to look at ourselves and make the decision and it's going to be easy and it doesn't matter how much knowledge you have it doesn't matter how much experience when you first take us when you you know the the trend of like day uh one day to day one yeah Right? Is is it the one day I'm going to do this, or is it day one that you're doing this type of thing? Mm-hmm. And even if you have the knowledge or you, you've you've done it before, day one still hurt, sucks. Yeah, yeah. Because day two still sucks. Right. And it's it's never a like it doesn't matter. It gets easier to some degree, but to a lot of to, to a huge situation, I, it can be it can be daunting and be difficult. And I mean, earlier today I was talking about like struggling with different little things. And as much as I have confidence in myself as much as there are 
mental thoughts are struggle. Our struggle. And, no, 100%. And it's, you know, I, I think for me, the, the perfect example is like, Liz breaks up with him, right? Yeah. He writes on the, the whiteboard before he passes out after being <laughs> drunk, right? As a reminder. <laughs> As a reminder. And him then still, like, he, want, he knows he wants, to, he wants to make progress. He wants, yeah. he wants to fix it. He wants to be a good guy. He, he does love her. But we get caught up in that, that everyday same thing. Wakes up, goes out the thing, at the door, just completely oblivious. Oblivious to the zombies walking <laughs> the, around the, him. The, 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 the hole in the car and the windshield, like, doesn't even see that no one comes to the register, just drops some the, change the on The one him. that's asking for money. And he's like, I don't have any change on me. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't re- oh my gosh, I love that scene. It's so good. But what, how many people right now go driving to work? They just, hey, Fred. They just threw the mundane. Uh, let's talk about this. How, how does the movie use this zombie apocalypse as a metaphor for the monotony of modern life, right? You, and there's a lot of imagery in, yeah. in, in the movie that does that. This scene, right? We, the first time we see that scene, which, again, listeners, we are big fans of, of one-ers yeah, here. I was good to see. Right? And, and so that, that first one Right where it, it tracks him from his house across the street to the other street and into the market, and then back out. Right, and we repeat that again the second time. Now that the zombie uh, apocalypse has gone into effect, <laughs> I love the scene where he opens the fridge and there's just the bloody hand. He doesn't even know what he's saying. <laughs> It's so good. And then he like slips and just uh, and this, <laughs> this, like he just goes about it, right? Yeah. Oh, oh something's on the floor. It's yeah. like whatever. But the, but there's a lot uh, of these imageries uh, or images um, that that are being used as as the zombie apocalypse as a metaphor for the monotony of, of, of modern life. Why does it work so well in this movie? If, if we look at zombies, right? Zombies on screen have always been de- depicted as these free roaming um no thought thoughtless creatures that just go from one target to the next to the next no real purpose no real um no real significance uh, as a horror element right there there are no jason there are no yeah there's not like a motivation yeah right you're you're, yeah which is what makes them you know to a sense is, is scary right that they're just if you cross their path, they're gonna they're gonna get you, right? Yeah. Um, put that in the, this backdrop of, of of monotony, of complacency, right? When when an individual falls into that, they just go from one thing to the next. No real motivation, no real purpose behind their actions. They just are doing what they're doing and moving on to the next thing that that comes across their way. Yeah, I, I think, again, uh, I think an, uh, another example of this is that they, uh, is a scene where they're trying to get into the Winchester. Mm-hmm. There's a, they pretend to be, yeah. they, <laughs> pre- they pretend to be zombies, uh, completely terribly, <laughs> to, <laughs> by, by, you know, they get to the door, they're having an argument, and the zombies are tr- attracted to the, I, I would say, like, it's like, if if you're an individual, you're you go to where the person who, who maybe is the leader mm-hmm. or the person that feels like they know what they're doing, and uh, and so they're drawn to this attention to this uh, commotion, and then Sean gets up and is like, "Hey, follow and he, me," and yeah. they just follow him. You just follow him because everyone else just doesn't stop talking and he's right. making the loudest sound. Yeah, and I feel like this movie is even better now because we have social media and we have these influencers and like, Ooh, yeah, like. How many, how many people like, and I'm even for myself, like I like this, you know, I'm like, I think as much as I can purchase a, another course or, uh, I can try to fought, consume a thing or even like purchase a coach, like some coach at the end of the day, it's the amount I have. There's enough knowledge there. It's the amount of work that goes into it. Mm-hmm. Or do I just continue trying to follow that next person? And then, and it's even to, 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 to a sense degree, like individual saying, you can then do this to other individuals. You can become a coach or yeah. whatever. And I'm not, look, I don't want to be down on anyone who's doing coaching or, or, you know, that type of work. But there is a level of like, of, of 
trying because there's a level of helping people and then there's a level of like having people like monopolizing on the mundanity of individuals mm-hmm. lives are you really actually helping them or there's actually a really great video um from this guy who's he's a little bit of an artist and he does these great i'll link it down below but i'm pretty sure it talks about like the, the cre- creator the creator cult hmm. and he talks about this idea that like in creators or even like you know um influencers or whatever of being so popular of people following and then saying oh purchase my course or purchase this thing and then you can find the success too yeah and not to say that people can't find success <clears throat> from the teachings of those individuals but life is weird and I'm, I've always been a firm believer of that, but I'm finding even more, even more now that like the, the foundations of business, the foundation of how things, how you, how you find your growth, doesn't matter how much knowledge you can consume. The moment you start to put it in practice, you have to learn it in a whole different way Yeah. that only you can do. The only you can do. And I think we see this a little bit to a degree with, again, Sean, you know, learning the understanding what he has okay we gotta hit the head hit him in the head and taking proactive approach going to get liz and having to deal with these these repercussions and finding little moments of growth like with his stepdad in the car and his stepdad finally like admitting look i'm sorry it was hard to come in as a as a father and you were 12 years old yeah and i just wanted to be i wanted to be a, a father figure for yeah you. yeah and it actually showing a sense of emotion for the first time ever and then having to like realize he died yeah. and he's going to become a zombie. He's going to have to kill him. Yep. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. It's impactful. It is. It, it really is. And look, we, I don't even know how we're, we're well into this episode, but we really even haven't talked to, uh, haven't talked about like the horror elements of this because this movie at its core is a, a character study. <laughs> Maybe it's really, <laughs> it is a character study. You know what I love about the, the movies that we've, we've picked thus far um, is that there are movies that leverage horror yep. for a greater commentary yep. piece. Yeah. Yeah. And which we, we didn't do this intentionally. It just, it no, just happened to be like, li- that's what we chose. Like, what, what movie should we do? Oh, we should do Shaun of the Dead. Oh, we should do, Oh, you know, we have to do, do kid out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I think we'll have more of that. And honestly, last night when I finished the movie, I was like, is this really a horror? Is this really a horror film? <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, it's got zombies in it's it. It's got zombies in it, but there's not any like like huge scares, right? Um, I I want to talk a little bit about about that scene with his stepdad. You know, what I loved about this movie as a kid, uh, and even more so now, is that it has two very impactful death scenes: his stepdad and his mom. Yeah, which to me at that point, I don't think I had seen again, quote unquote, a horror movie, really take the moment to like, let me experience that. Like, or yeah, yeah, the fact that like, if you had to kill somebody, it's because they were self-protecting. They were they self-protected. Were, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were trying to do self-defense. Yeah. It wasn't something that like, I have to do this because there's, unless, or I'm, I'm doomed. Or, or, or even like those few minutes before where they have those emotional oh, yeah. boots, yeah, yeah, right? Better, yeah. Like, y- there isn't that that uh, dialogue of of expression and and coming to terms with whether it's his dad or him as his mom realizing he yeah he got her the flowers and and she's happy about it and even though he tried to pawn them off to Liz <laughs> <laughs> to win her back <laughs> to win her back uh, I love that she just like these are for your mom weren't they <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, it's just for your mom oh that was me being funny from yesterday's <laughs> comment. <laughs> to find the way to oh my gosh uh but i love that those scenes right and 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 simon Pegg talked about talks about this how he had a stepdad and how he never got along with him and this was again bringing personal experience he was working through his emotions and feelings of his stepdad as he was writing, writing. this this part of the movie look i've heard that if you want to be a really good storyteller that you should carry on a book or your note, you know, your notes in your phone. And anytime you hear something interesting or whatever, that you should write it down. Hmm. Because one of the biggest things you can do for a film or for a story is to include real life events. Pull from personal experience. Personal, right? Pull from personal experience. I mean, who? it's so relatable. Yeah. I love the, I mean, in the plan, 
the plan is always to kill yeah. the, de- the, the stepdad. <laughs> and I love that the stepdad, and they're having this argument, and he's like, <laughs> I love this scene. <laughs> Where he's like, Mom, I just have to tell you. <laughs> what's the dad, the dad's name? Or the stepdad name? Uh, uh, oh, is the, I don't know, whatever. Uh, Samuel has touched me <laughs> for occasion. <laughs> His mom's just looking at him like. Philip. Philip. <laughs> Philip's. His, uh, he touched me on several occasions. And his she, mom, she just turned. knows that, like, are you freaking kidding me right now? <laughs> I'm sorry, I took that too far. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I just, uh, I just freaking it's so good. But but then, I love the smash cut or the the step. Da- Phil comes in, and he's like, "What are you talking you know, about?" And like, and then it cuts to exterior, mm-hmm. and then we see him come out with 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 uh, Phil, and it's just like, "What the heck?" <laughs> I thought that what what happened to the plan? What happened to the plan? <laughs> It's so good, and I love that, again, the movie takes these moments uh, of, of character growth and development in this backdrop of, of a zombie apocalypse for Sean to grow and, and to be able to come out of his conformity, his com- his complacency, and, and be able to move on as a, as an individual and as a character. I think that th- this movie helped to really showcase the, the whole zombie sort of genre yeah. in emphasizing that character... Is king, mm, yeah. Right. We look at The Walking Dead. I don't think we would have as long of a Walking Dead if it wasn't for the a good example of. Okay, should it be about the zombies? No. Right. I think the only movie that maybe that does a really good job with this, and I don't know if there's a zombie, is I Am Legend. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's not necessarily zombie. We don't know. It's like some sort of virus thing. But like this right. thing that they're left alone, you know, isolation and. The whole thing, right? And, but we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have Walking Dead. We wouldn't have, I mean, I think I am legend to a degree. I think the other portion is we wouldn't have The Last of Us, even though they're, you know, it was based, it's a game, but still, it's the idea that we should focus on the, the individual, the character. And that's why, like, the, the Last of Us, a lot of individuals were really worried because The Last of Us, the game, it's a phenomenal game. Yeah, yeah. And it focuses on that that sort of character journey mm-hmm. for the situation, right? I don't know. It, it's really good. Uh, I know we're coming up on time, but um, your favorite scene? Um, honestly, I think my favorite scene has is the last fight. Is In the Winchester? In the Winchester. With the queen playing in the background? <laughs> So, so no, just, I think, or, so it was, it would probably have to be after the queen, even though that's a really funny, I love that scene. Uh-huh. <laughs> this freaking song, and they're all beating the zombie to beat, <laughs> to the beat. I would say from the moment they get the gun to okay. them exiting the, the basement cellar thing. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. That's, that scene sequence, um, it's probably my favorite, and I think part of that is because we see a... We see the payoff and the connection to Ed, yeah, and Sean. the 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 great connection for who they are as individuals, but also that like Sean appreciated Ed because he accepted him, but also because he made life fun. Yeah, and that to a degree, all like there are individuals in our lives that are outside of our spouses mm-hmm. that we need to have, that we should have, that in a lot of times people that can help you get through it. Because look, at the end of the day, like I'm not saying every person needs to go out and like start their own business or yeah, yeah. change it, but like... But to fa- pursue your dreams. Pursue pursue a dream or pursue um, enjoyment and in, in, mm. in enjoying life and find individuals that help you to do that. Yeah. And I'm not saying because Ed obviously doesn't do that, but for Sean, it he it, it, he was that character. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, like, and I think that's why it's impactful that he like yells at him, right? Gets angry at him, and is, you know, and then we see this payoff in the cellar. He's dying. He knows he's gonna become a zombie. And having such, him just still being him. Yeah. And still, still being him. 
exactly yeah and and for sean to find that comfort that his buddy is still him yeah well, that's a good one i like that yeah my mine is definitely the "Don't Stop Me Now" sequence of <laughs> just beating, beating the 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 bar owner with dun, the. Dun, dun. <laughs> I love it for just several reasons. What I I think a lot of American viewers don't like Shaun of the Dead because it's British. It's British, obviously. I freaking love. I, okay, actually, can I just take a quick? Bo- Sorry, I have to do a soapbox. Please, please, please. I love British humor. British humor. I I tell my wife often. We should just move to Inc. Like we should, <laughs> like one of if you like if you like Shaun the you should really check out Fisk on Netflix. Okay, it's Australian but very simple. Like uh-huh. some, it's it's literally about this this. Uh, she's a uh, is she a pet no, no she's like a lawyer, and she's trying to she moves to this she moves away from her ex husband, and she <laughs> she goes she's trying to go to this like funeral mm-hmm. lawyer like work. And she like wears the same clothes, like baggy dress, and like this. Anyway, the whole sequence is she's very mundane yeah. and very like whatever. But it's just such good, like okay, so not well. American humor. Uh-huh. And I, f- it's like that dry, real life, just kind of like commentary on life. Yeah, yeah. And like, which I love. I freaking think it's hilarious, yeah. bro. I love. I bust up laughing all the time because of it. And I just, I, I. Don't know why people, and I don't know why Americans can't <laughs> to a degree. And I don't know, I don't know why I understand it honestly. I literally don't know why I think it's the funniest thing ever, and I connect with it so yeah. much. I think part of it is just because I'm a person that like I connect. I really like. I I just enjoy a good laugh. Right, right. No, I I, I think I remember when 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 it came out or when I was watching it, and the few people that saw it in like my social circle in high school, uh, just were like, oh, it's just. It wasn't funny, or there wasn't enough action, right? And and if you put, if had you made Shaun of the Dead in the states, okay, take place in the states, everyone's gonna have a gun, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, like the fact that all they have is just the cricket bat, right? Um, I, yes. it makes sense. And 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 I love this sequence of "Don't Stop Me Now" because it's a pivotal moment. Mom, mom has been bit. She's about to transform. And it's just, it's like the most actiony aspect of it. But there's humor to it because they're beating him to the beat of the music. <laughs> you have you have mom and and, and Diane just kind of like <laughs> rocking back and forth to the beat of it as well Don't as their stop beating. me now. <laughs> it's just so funny. Which again, had this taken in, in the states, everyone would have a gun. There'd be a lot of shooting, a lot of explosions. And that's not what this movie was ever meant to be. Yeah. Right? Um, and so I love that it's grounded in that aspect, that they just have to defend themselves. They just have these these uh, uh, billard sticks, and they're just beating the crap out of they them. They don't even break them to, like, stab, to stab them. them. No, they're just going just on it. <laughs> just like... <laughs> and, and, and it's just like I just I remember every time I watch it, and the first time I watch it, I was just not expecting almost this choreographed... Uh, Every action single. musical <laughs> in the middle of the movie, and it's just I love it. It's just great. It's funny. Um, it killed the queen. What? <laughs> and then like the, <laughs> it's just. Great. I just you know it 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 really I I, I appreciate that you brought this to like because I didn't even connect it. I didn't even think about like what would have happened if this was based in the states. Oh yeah, no yeah. But it, it completely derails it. Oh yeah, and yeah. it would be. I mean, or even like reemphasizing like the news. Just stay in your homes and mm-hmm. like this. I all I don't know. Just really, I really do love it. I think that part of that that scene then leads into the scene that I like. Yeah, exactly. You have this huge commotion, mm-hmm. and you know that this is the final moment. Like they're gonna get overwhelmed. Yep. Right. David Freeman gets what he what's Freaking coming for David. David. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a gory. Death, why, man. why do you why do you think we hate David so much? David, uh, look. <laughs> if you are Sean, if you if you have ever been in Sean's place, okay, where you know you have a buddy who has the hots for your girlfriend, okay, it's just a knowing one, and 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 he just he sticks around hoping that maybe you break up so that way he can go in for the kill. One, that sucks. Two, David is just 
I don't know. I just hate the <laughs> I you know what I think it is? I think it's that that it's the you put up with it because it's your girlfriend's best friend's boyfriend. Boyfriend. But he wants you your girl. And you know, every he's always making you look like the bad guy. He always has a commentary on something. Yes. And you have to then put yourself you like you like you don't want to rock the boat. You don't want to be, come off as rude, right? But then this individual, especially because of the way she, where Sean's positioned as he positioned himself yeah. as a bum, not really taking any action because he's become complacent. He's like, no, you know, I'm gonna do. I'll, he because here's the thing. He he says it. You know, he's like he. I'm the senior person here. And like you know, like he want he wants to do things. Yeah, yeah. But I think a lot, it comes back to like. There's no freaking roadmap. Yep, yep, yep. Life has no freaking roadmap. Has no roadmap. Every <clears throat> this is the thing that I realized after I graduated college. No one ever they're like, okay, go to college. They tell you, you know, get a graduate from high school, go to college, get a degree, go to work. No one tells you like when you get to work, everyone just shows up. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there might be a lot of sitting around for a lot of days. Oh yeah, for some stuff. Not that you're not doing work, but like. You're waiting on someone to do something so that you can do something, and then and so you're just just you might, waiting. You're just waiting. Yeah. That to me was one of the biggest shocks of my entire life. <laughs> I was like, "What? Wait, you just want me like? So what do you want me to do? Yeah, you know, you just chill out. We'll send you out to something in a second. Wait, you want me to just chill? Sit here? <laughs> All you want me to do is just one thing? Like that's it? Like nothing else? <laughs> you don't want me like go, like, okay." It's always been one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with. <laughs> That's funny. That's interesting. <laughs> no, you're right. But oh, this movie, man. Hey, you know what's funny? It's great. I, I, I got done watching it last night and I was like, I don't know if I have a lot of th- thoughts to talk about. It's, you know, look, D- Danny knows that I, when I write, when I do my, I write extensive notes. And I appreciate it because not th- it's, I don't. No, you don't. But this time around, I only wrote three bullet points. <laughs> okay. And not because the movie didn't have anything to say, but I was just swept up in it. <laughs> I just was like, I am going to enjoy this movie. And I did. And I, I wrote down notes. And you wrote down notes. But I, this is the first time where I, I just kind of was like, yeah, this is great. I love it. And then by the end of the movie, I was like, I wrote nothing. But that's okay because I, I just was immersed in it. Last thing I want to say, this movie, I finished it. And we talked about this in our uh, episode of Ant Man and the Wa- and Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantumania. We talked a little bit about how Edgar Wright was going to do the first Ant Man. Yes, he wrote the movie, filmed a little bit of it. Then creative differences, he left, but they kept like seventy percent of what he wrote in that movie. Um, I watched this and I was like, Why couldn't he have just done Ant Man? Freaking Kevin Feige freaking Marvel for screwing him over and not letting him film the movie that he wanted because this movie especially like the the scenes in in Ant-Man in the first especially in the first Ant-Man where they talk about the plan and they do the quick cuts right they are not as good as they are here that that whole aspect of Ant-Man is a thousand percent Edgar Wright yeah Right, you see so much of Edgar Wright in that movie because mm-hmm. they kept again like seventy percent of that movie uh, from what he wrote, but it's not executed as good or as funny or as efficient or as styled stylized because it was um, what's his name Sean or I can't remember the director. Yeah, I can't remember right now. But it's not Edgar Wright, and I, I I finished this movie and I was like I had so many like scenes of Ant Man flowing in my head. I'm like. Uh, it just would have been that all, all of that man would have been just so much better had Edgar Wright uh, been able to film the movie that he wanted. To Dang, film. Now I really want Edgar Wright and uh, Michael Pena to like team up on the film. Right. They would slay all, all of all of Michael Pena's dialogue in that movie. Yeah. Came from Edgar Wright. <clears throat> You know what? I'm waiting for I'm waiting for Michael Pena to come out with a to do a directorial to do some sort of movie. Okay. I feel like he I feel like I, maybe he just really loves acting. Yeah, yeah. I just feel like he's been in a lot of different t- genres of films. Mm-hmm. 
of, of TV and movies and stuff that he is such a versatile individual. We have to do chips. I love <laughs> I have not seen chips. Okay. <laughs> it's Michael Pena in that movie is freaking hilarious. With, uh, what's his name? The tall guy, right? Yeah, with uh, uh, what's the Reese Witherspoon's husband, uh, Dax Shepard. That's Reese, was his, Reese Witherspoon's husband? I'm, Dax? I'm pretty sure. Are you da- sure? Yeah, Dax Shepard. Kristen Bell. That's all. Kristen Bell. That's- Sorry. Blonde, famous actress. I have a struggle with it. Yeah, Kristen Bell. That's Kristen Bell's uh, husband. Really? Yeah. They've been married for a long time. Uh, and Oh, yes, 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 yes. You're right. You're right. They, I, think, I don't know if they met, but the, when she did Veronica Mars, which is a phenomenal series. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you watched it? I've seen like two episodes. Oh my gosh, bro. I remember I remember watching that. Actually, I started that. Anyways, yeah, we'll have to talk about that later. Anyways. Uh, That's right, because he's in the uh, One in Rome. Did you ever see One in Rome? I did see One in Rome. I love One in Rome. It's like one of my guilty pleasures <laughs> <laughs> movies. We're going we're gonna to do that one. February. February, February for Valentine's with, Day. Love, love season. Oh, I'm excited for February now. Good stuff. Anyways, no, yeah. He, him and, him and Dax Robert, but I just think like, he would, he would just, I feel like he would do, really do a great job. Because hmm. I feel like he could do writer, director. Yeah. Or even writer, like actor, and team up with like a director like Edgar mm-hmm. and have, be able to like, you know, you know, give us some magic. Just give us some magic, right? I, just, I wish Edgar Wright had really done <clears throat> Ant Man. It would just been epic. Look, let's hope for him teaming up with DC. Ooh. That would be. I don't know, dude. He, I feel like he hated his experience, and he's very, he's been very opinionated about yeah. how it was, yeah. like having a big studio, like control everything. But yeah. all right, well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. We would love it if you could subscribe on whatever platform you get your podcast. And if you're so inclined, and you're in your Spotify or Apple, be sure to leave us a review so we know what you thought about the episode, and so we can make it better. More importantly, we want to hear from you. What are your favorite scenes from Shaun of the Dead? What did we miss? What do you want to talk about? Uh, you can always message us on email at your at realchumps.com or connect with us again on social at realchumps. You can find me, Marcel, on Twitter at Marstrosity, M-A-R-Z-T-R-O-S-I-T-Y. And me on Rubio at Rubio underscore TV. One day we'll have to change this to X, but not till I die. Freaking whatever. <laughs> Sorry. Join us next week as we continue our journey into some of the favorite spooky films uh, with A Quiet Place. I've seen this once. Me too. Loved it, but I just never came back to it. Sorry. Can I make a can I can I throw a curveball? Do it. Can we actually compare A Quiet Place and No Time or No One's There to Save You? You know what? Maybe we should. Let's let's do it. And if the audience say otherwise but for now we'll plan on a quiet place with uh no one will save you yeah and we'll we'll make it more about the comparison yeah. instead of just, so all right watch those two movies and uh, catch us next week we'll see you guys